Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for tonight's edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series, our book, book edition. And I'm happy, excited after a break, a brief break. We are back and better tonight. We'll be looking at a book titled Negotiation. And we have two discussants. We have our ever reliable, dependable, Ezine Obiora. And my sister, I was about to say something and I remember I'm on here, so I won't say it publicly. Quincy Okun. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to the safe hands of my sisters, Ezine Obiora and Quincy Okun. You have the floor. Thank you, Gabby. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to be back after the break, the short break that Yemi talked about. It's good to be back in the book review train. <laughs> okay, so yes, uh, this for the month, this we're reviewing the uh, book for the month of January, which is negotiating uh, a skill which is vital for essential managers. And uh, I'm going to open the floor. Um, well, I'm going to hand uh, Uwa is going to be co-facilitating or co-reviewing with me. But first of all, I'd like to say, like I, I put up on um, LinkedIn, negotiation is an everyday thing. It's something we do in our daily inter interactions. You know, everything we're doing is negotiation. You have, you know, from the point you get up, you know, you just think about what do I do? Do I wake up? Do I have coffee? Do I have tea? Whether you're having an internal negotiation or external negotiation, you're negotiating at every point in time. But we're bringing it, you know, to the workplace and then in, you know, whatever deals we're having. So, uh, and I stumbled across this really great quote by Harvey McKay, who said, you don't get what you want, you get what you negotiate for. So, I mean, it's a vital skill to have. So I'm sure that we will take some learnings from, you know, the review that we, we do today. I, so without much ado, I'm going to hand over to Uwa. Uwa is going to open the floor for us. And then you will see me later on to finish up uh, the remaining chapter. So Uwa, over to you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Zine. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to. Oh, yeah, they say welcome to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but yes, um, it's good to have everyone here. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to share my screen so that we would see, <laughs> so that we'll see what we're talking about. Yes, yeah, this is an interesting book, by the way. And thank you, Zine, for that uh, introduction because. She's right. Negotiation happens in our everyday lives. We tend to, there are a lot of things we're doing and we don't even know when negotiating what we are, one way or another. Anyway, as we progress, uh, I guess we'll find out <clears throat> the many things. But yes, so what is negotiation without further ado? Um, so these are things, or these are what I came up with with uh, a visual representation of what uh, negotiating is. For me, negotiating is the practical application of preparation meeting opportunity. Because the truth is that if you're gonna get anything that you want, you need to be well prepared because the opportunity can present itself anytime, any day. So for me, I meeting opportunity in practicalization. I mean, Think of a promotion discussion. I mean, if you go, if you say you deserve a promotion or you are ready for a promotion, obviously you have to come with your reasons. You have to come with strong points. Why um why do I deserve to be uh, promoted? It's a discussion. You are communicating your move, but at the same time, you are telling your boss or your employer that this is what I've brought to the table and this is what I can bring to the table and. Um, yeah, so think of that. Think of when you pitch an idea. I mean, you're trying to sell an idea to somebody and you want that person to invest in you. And the person has to see reasons to invest. And the person would not invest if you don't come with very strong points. You want to buy a house. How do you get the best deal? You get collective bargaining, what I, what I shot into CBT. You say that you're trying to come to you're trying to prevent an impasse and you want everyone to come to the table getting what they want. 
it's happened. Like the negotiation thing is happening every day in our lives. It's different between getting what you want now than getting it later. Because what you do as you decide, okay, this is what I want. What you do is based on preparation and it's based on how well and how effectively you negotiate. It's strategy and counter moves, eating an agreeableness for dinner, because the truth is, if you want something, you need to have your moves in your head. You need to have the the moves, the things that you want to um, unleash so that you can get those moves, so you can get what you want now. Because if you save it for later, you're not getting what you want. And you're at a loss. And you need that thing at that moment. Negotiating is that. It's the defense for avoidable checkmates. I mean, how best can you get the, what is the way to get the best out of whatever discussion, whatever, you know, that's it. it so lastly is the amphitheater for testing effective communication skills. How best can I get someone to understand my point of view? That's how I see negotiation. It's at that point, you, you both are at the table. You are like gladiators. You are in the field now and everyone is looking at you and you are deciding, okay, this is what I want to do at this point. Like this is where we are. This is our, our these are our wants. These are our needs. These are the issues. These are my interests. How best do we serve ourselves and still get best out of this? So yeah, that's how I see negotiation. Okay, so, but these are definitions. So what is negotiating in defined purposes? It's a strategic discussion intended to resolve an issue in a way that both parties find acceptable. It's a discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. Obviously, you, you have interest. You are one party that has an interest and the other party has an interest. And that will not happen if both of you don't come to an agreement. There has to be an agreement. And it's a process that speakers go through to reach a clear understanding of each other. So that means effective communication. Some of us say that we, um, we are so good at effectively communicating, but negotiation tests that. In fact, it's the, it's the, I would call it the litmus test for effective communication. You say that you can tell somebody, sorry, someone is talking because the person mute, so I'm not uh, distracted. So it's a little more test for how effectively you can communicate. And that is, so that's just a basic understanding of what negotiating is. So what can you achieve from negotiation? Better conflict resolution, whether internal or external. I already talked about CBD, that's like an external conflict resolution, but talking internally, um, sorry, there's someone, uh, could the person mute so that you don't distract me? Okay, um, so I said better conflict resolution, whether internal or external. I already talked about collective bargaining, that's external. How do you reach the best interests possible? How do you serve external stakeholders? And then internal resolutions. Two employees have an issue and they need to settle it. How best can you, as the HR person, because I'm focusing on HR because we are HR professionals. This is a HR professional group, so it's only fair that we focus on you. But I mean, it applies to almost everybody. So how best do you serve those interests? How best can you say both of them can achieve what they want to achieve and leave the table feeling happy? Can also help you to build more cost-effective and reliable supply chains. Imagine you work in a factory, you work in, um, it, you, especially if you work in the manufacturing sector, you're always going to need suppliers for a lot of things. And how best can you come to a, an agreeable price that doesn't affect both parties? That's where negotiating wow. comes in. That is how, how effectively you can achieve that is negotiation. Um, yeah. So enhance financial value measures, positions. If you are someone that is at the helm of affairs, for those of you who are in the legal field, um, so you understand how this works. And in fact, I think this works for everybody, not just those in the legal field, but those in the legal field understand how these things work or it works for everybody. So measures and acquisitions, you can be the defining moment, the defining factor in ensuring that these measures or acquisitions do not become 
something that would fill any party long term. So you can decide, okay, these are the amount of people we can keep, these are the amount of people we can lose, or if we can keep all or nobody. So you is your negotiation skills that would help that. Um, also in achieving stable or effective corporate governance. So you can negotiate, okay, is someone, how who, who is gonna be the next CEO, who is gonna succeed in, the, in any role that is empty, you know, engaging with your employees, how can you serve their needs? How can you serve their interests? So these are the benefits of effective negotiation. Okay, so what are different myths in negotiation? Um, so the first one says it involves conflict. Now here's the thing, you cannot just say, you cannot, it, I know people tend to see that because people go with the mindset of, I must win or I must lose. One way or another, it has to be a zero sum game. But the truth is, negotiation is what you make of it. You understand? Both of you can decide, okay, you know what? We both have interests that we want to serve. How best can we serve them? So you come to the table with that mindset. Or you can come to the table and say, you know what? This person is below me. This person does not have, you can decide to underestimate your counterpart. And maybe in the long term, it works out well for you, or maybe it doesn't. It can end up both ways. But at the end of the day, it doesn't always, involve. in fact, an effective negotiation always almost always ends in both parties walking away with what they want there are no sore losers that's that shows that oh yes that was very effective okay another myth is that it's an innate ability well that's a lie because yes some people have some skills some things that are in them but the truth is anything can be learned just like negotiating People do, do not reach the heights or levels that they've reached by just waiting for things to happen. They actually went out and learned them. It's like saying, if I sit down here, I will not have to sing. It's not possible. You have to go and practice, you know, tune your vocals, tune everything, ensure that everything's working out fine. So anything can be learned, just like negotiation. So it's only fair. And another myth is that you always need brashness. Well, that's a lie. You don't always need to be brash in negotiation. You need to have it, it helps to have a mix of empathy or assertiveness. Although we know that there are people that just because they know that they have the upper hand, so they decide to go the brash way. They always ensure that they are putting their points, <laughs> they are putting their major point, they are very strong points. They're sure that yes, one person lives there. Um, embarrassed and you know disheveled all the many <laughs> synonyms for that but yes and I think that's when people are negotiating from a place of bad faith but if you are negotiating with interest you don't always need to be brash it's not even advisable but yeah at the end of the day we're human beings you can tell us to do this or you can advise us to do this but it's up to us to take that advice or not yeah. Okay. And another myth is you should always go for the most you can get. That's the myth. Don't always do that. You go in with a strategy, a clear strategy of what you want. Do I want to, um, what do I want out of this deal? These are the things I want out of this deal. And that's what I'm going to get. And that will happen when you've done adequate research, but we'll get to that, you know. So don't always go into, um, in negotiating part of thinking that you must get just about everything. Sometimes think long-term, don't always be greedy. I know it's a human trait and we can't avoid it. Well, there are some people that would always be greedy. Yes, we can't avoid it, that's human nature. But the thing is, a negotiation must not always be that way. Yeah, so what are some dilemmas uh, in negotiation? You know, you go to the negotiation table and you're thinking, oh, if I go this way, this will happen. You know, you're, you're stuck between two different things. You want to know how do I solve this? How do I do this? Yeah, so these are some dilemmas. So you have the strategy or opportunity dilemma. So 
people will go in and say, you know what, I'm here. This is what I want. So avoid that dilemma of changing your strategy as soon as, as, soon as you get, in, get to the negotiation table because you think, oh, once I get there, this is what I've seen this, so this is what I can do. Know what you want. I think that's a human problem. Once we get to a particular place, we start thinking, hey, there is something new. Oh, I see something that will help me. And you you forget entirely why you went there. There's no, you, you lose your focus. Stay focused, queens and kings. <laughs> so stick to your strategy, do not divert. Then there's the honesty dilemma, because you're thinking, uh, do I, do I tell this person everything? Do I give all the information I have? That in the long term can play against you because if you decide to tell the person everything, because truth is that both parties have their needs and they have their wants, you get. So if you now decide to lay all your cards, we've talked about strategy. You need to have a strategy going forward. If you lay all your cards on the table, you may be putting yourself at the hands of the other person. And that person might use everything to their advantage. So it's better you keep most of your cards to your chest. Everything must not come out in the open. It's not necessary. Yeah, so strike a balance. The other party does not need to know everything. Yeah. And then there's the empathy dilemma. So with the empathy dilemma, you're thinking, okay, maybe I should come to, I should try to understand this person like, you are you are being so empathic. There's nothing bad with empathy. The problem is when you can't balance it out. You get so maintain rapport, but also be assertive with your interests. Your interests are just as important as the next person's. So don't think that because um, you empathize means you must drop everything. You are here to achieve something. You can't achieve it if you go overboard. So learn to strike that balance, yeah. And then there's a trust dilemma. Trusting someone implicitly, you're saying, yes, take all my, it's like surrendering your, all your ass now. Maybe you're at the fight and you just surrender all your ass now to the next person. Say, yes, take care of them. Don't worry, I trust you. It's like being at the wall and submitting all your weapons to the next part. How does that even work? It's, it's, it's not possible. At the end of the day, we're still human beings. No matter how people try to come up with how they have this, they have principles, they have this and that. The truth is you can't really trust anybody implicitly, even yourself. Yeah, can you trust yourself implicitly? Not to talk about another human being, just saying. So think of that also with this thing. I mentioned three series here because I enjoy, um, these series tend to bring out uh, some of the things when it comes to trust, I, I'm rewatching House of Descent, and I like when he tells his patients that he he the patients always lie, and they tend to always prove him right because he asks them questions, and at that point you're negotiating your life, so he's asking you questions there, and you, and you are lying to him. How will he solve your problem? And most of the time, they always tend to come out and say everything and he ends up helping them the right way you get. So he never trusts his patients fully. He understands human nature and that's it. So elementary Tinder Swindler, you see what happens when um, all those women were trusting that guy and he gives them the same story and they were falling victim to his schemes, you know? So yeah. Then he competes or cooperates dilemma. So you, you go to the negotiating table and you're saying, I must compete. Or you're saying you must cooperate. You're not doing both. You're not striking that balance. You see, there's one word that keeps coming up, balance. Because negotiating involves a lot of balance. From the psychological to the strategic, everything, there's always a balance. So while you're competing for benefits, also cooperate with the other party to ensure that you create those benefits and claim them. So find that balance so value can be achieved on both sides of the table. So like I said earlier, preparation is what makes the success of your negotiation. If you go to the negotiation table unprepared, 
be very sure that you would lose. You may lose here yeah, because it's like going to an exam. Shout out to all the people that wrote CIPM today. Imagine if they are not read for their exams. They won't be able to write just about anything. You understand? So you have to prepare. In fact, anything in life, it's not just negotiating, but anything in life that you're doing, it involves preparation. And you cannot get the best out of it if you are not prepared for whatever you have to do. Okay. So going to the negotiation table, what would help you when you get there. Um, so you have to be psychologically comfortable. So you, adapt, you don't allow feelings, rule, rationality. So I've been talking about um, striking a balance. Imagine going, we talked about the trust dilemma. We talked about the, um, the trust dilemma, the strategy dilemma, the honesty dilemma. So if you go to the negotiation table and you are just allowing your feelings rule your decisions, you may end up shooting yourself in the foot. So there are a lot of things that can happen, but you need to get to a point where you allow rationality rule feelings. Feelings are fleeting. In fact, they're all reliable and they always change. So it only helps to allow yourself, allow rationality rule, think of things in abstract. Think of them in a very different way. Think of numbers, think of data. HR analyst, you know how data works for you. So think of that. Um, learn to tolerate and adapt to uncertainties. It is that when you are talking about something, you never know what to happen. That's truth. You can never know. In fact, most of the time, you may be unprepared for what will happen. Uh, look at uh, when the pandemic happened and nobody was prepared for what happened. If we're being honest, nobody was prepared. But we just tried our best and said, okay, you know, after a while, people were able to adapt. And now we call it the new normal. So now companies have adapted to that and they have hybrid working environments. Okay, before I go on, is everybody still following me? Are we still good? So, so it doesn't feel like I'm talking to myself. Are we still good? <laughs> if 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 I'm if I'm still okay, I'm seeing one blessing. Thank you, blessing. Yes. Yeah, so I hope everybody's still following me. Okay, okay, that's good. Bisola, I can see you. Yes, Ola Dusu. Okay, thank you, thank you. I like that we're doing this. Okay, so let's go back to thank you, Chidima. Okay, um, so going back to what will help you in negotiation. You have to learn how to make strategic decisions, even if you have incomplete information. Now, the truth is, um, at the negotiation table, you may not have all the information that you need to make the best decision, but you now need to train yourself. This is why I said preparation research is very important. You may, most of the time, you may not have all the information. That's the truth. You may not have all the information. So you need to learn to make decisions with incomplete information. It might be hard, but the truth is you have to learn because there's a lot of adapting you're doing. There's a lot of adapting you're doing at the negotiation table. Yeah. Okay, so you have to learn to tell your approach to negotiating in a flexible way. Now, there are some people that would like to um, negotiate publicly, some rights to negotiate privately. They don't think they should come to the public because some people like backdoor, backroom or backdoor room dealings. So they like that. They will prefer, okay, you know what? I'm talking to a lot of people at this point. I would, I would rather negotiate with you who I think I can trust and they will do that. So you should be open to being flexible because you can see, okay, the other person is not comfortable. How best? Now, if someone says, oh, okay, you know what? Let's have a meeting at Toso Soul Restaurant so that we can talk. I feel more comfortable there. Are you okay with having that discussion there? You get, you've, you've seen, you, you've had experiences with um, people that you're trying to, for those of you that understand where I'm going to, you you wanted to have meetings because maybe you're trying to work on a project, you're trying to get funding, whatever the case. And 
these people would prefer that you meet in more informal surroundings so that you can get, so that they are more comfortable. Get one way or another, you have to learn to be flexible. Okay, um, think of solving problems and creating opportunities instead of winning and losing. I talked about this earlier. Don't go to a, the table thinking about whether you're going to win or lose. It's human nature, we understand that, but never, don't always go to the table thinking of winning or losing. Think of creating opportunities. How best can both of us get to? I mean, for those of you that are married, before you got married, I'm sure people sat down and had conversations. Okay, I'm going to spend my life with you. Well, these are the these are my non-negotiable. These are the things I would like and you would like. You thought about all those things and you thought of okay, this is how we can solve social so, so, so problems. Of course, nobody can know anything hundred percent, but you try to figure out the best ways that both of you can stay in that relationship or conversation. Okay, so another thing: set clear objectives. Know when to make concessions and when to assert yourself. A concession is when you give in. And asserting yourself means, oh, this is my level of strength and this is the best time. This is what will favor me and also favor you. So let's work with this. So no, and that can happen if you don't even know what your objectives are. You can't just go to the table and say, okay, you know what? I know what I want to you, you have to know why you are there, how you intend to create value for yourself. All those things need to be known so that you know, okay, at this point, then, and if you're doing that, that means you have to think of, you have to embrace losing. Because a lot of people are human beings. Obviously, there are times we've been sore losers. We lost something that we really wanted and we acted so irrationally, you get. So think of it. You have to be adaptable to losses. You can't always be a sore loser. So know when to make it an obsession and know when to assert yourself one way or another. Avoid availability bias. So filter available information because the truth is that there's information that is always public. You get, because the truth is both parties have um, the things that they know and the things they don't want you to know. So avoid relying on what you just see in the public. Find out the things that are not there, that are not clear for the world to see, you get. If, if it's something that you can find on the internet, then you know it's not always reliable. You have to find the things that aren't there, that someone can't find by the click of a finger. So know how to do that. Avoid confirmatory bias. So what, there are things that you think are not important, so you skip them. Because you think, ah, oh, uh, this thing doesn't seem important. You know what, let's just skip, let's just move on. Every, analyze every single detail. Data is key. So, Analyze every single detail that you have there because it is important. You don't know how well it will help you in the future. Never be overconfident and undermine your counterpart. This is very important. You say you want to serve your interest, right? Never, ever. This That's what happened when Goliath underestimated David. <laughs> and so what happened to him? <laughs> so never, ever be overconfident. Never undermine your counterparts. It does not play well for you in the long term. Yes. What more things will help you? Have limits. Know your why, how, and what answers. Why do you want to make that deal? How can it create value for you? What are your deal breakers? What alternatives can you accept? This is very important because people just go to the negotiating table and they forget why they are there or they don't even know why they are there. So if you can answer these questions, it will limit um, any, any extras you put on yourself. That need to always fall for the Kool-Aid to limit that on you and you leave there feeling satisfied. Set high objective, but not outrageous ones. Avoid censoring your objectives. There are people that like to go above and beyond. They want the whole earth and the moon. Where will other people stay? know what you want it, it's still the play on greed like i said greed is innate but learn to control it or learn to even you know walk around it but as much as you are setting high objectives 
also learn to censor your objective, but don't, oh, sorry, avoid censoring your objectives. Don't say, okay, don't um, shoot yourself in the leg. Go for as much as you want, but don't be outrageous with it. So that you don't get escalation of commitment. You know, you want to win at any cost. So you've brought out this thing that you want to achieve. Yes, I must buy this bag, whatever cost. And you do whatever it takes. Have some limits, have some limits, have some limits. Do your research. I've, I've, I've hammered on this. It's very necessary. It's different between getting what you think you want and what could have been a better offer. You understand? Because you go to the table and you're saying, okay, this is what you want. Meanwhile, you could have gotten 10 or 100 times better than what you're getting. But because you decided not to do that research and you ended up losing, and you're now asking yourself why you did that. You are self-sabotaging, you're going to your room, you're crying your eyes out. For those of you that cry, <laughs> Or you're just you're just feeling less of yourself. That's very that's a mistake that you should try and avoid. Then know the people on the other end of the table. How can you work around their interests and deal breakers? What are their strengths and weaknesses? I've already said that before. Don't underestimate them. Can they do a partner? A partner is a best alternative to negotiated agreements. So let's say you've already come to an agreement. Is there any alternative that can work if you do not get what you want? Yeah. That's that. Then keep to time the temporal process. Ensure you know your time, your venue, and you're committed to it. You don't start changing times and venues when people have already agreed on something. Manage the information collected. There's a lot of information that's going to pass when you are having discussion. It's a discussion, so obviously a lot of things are going to come up. So manage the information, process it well, and ensure that you have you you filtered what you need and what you don't need. Then understand human behavior. That's a psychosocial person. Don't leave the table, I said earlier, don't leave the table not building a rapport with the person. I mean, it's not necessary, but it does help because we're human beings. So we tend to respond to um, our psychosocial needs. We want to know, okay, uh, this, does this person look trustworthy? Can I? talk to this person outside this place. Build their rapport. I think it, it builds more trust when both of you can, you know, talk informally, even without all the seriousness that um, a, this thing involves, like the negotiation involves. Okay, so our next chapter, negotiating styles. So at this point, um, we are, we are here to understand the different styles we have. So the book tells us that there are different styles. All of us have different styles, but three major ones. So there's a distributive style of negotiation. It's a zero sum game. Yes, it's all or nothing. Compete or die, no friends in the game. And I, I, I had to put, I don't know, before I go on, how many people have seen Suits, the series? If you've seen it, could you indicate in the chat box if you've seen it? Because it will help when, when we go further with this particular styles so you understand where I'm even going to. So if you say Suits, could you indicate in chat box? Suits is a, is a series, S-U-I-T-S. I think I spelled it here. Okay. Okay, isn't it? So, you know, I'm going to talk about this. Obviously, you may not, okay, you're about to see blessing. You know? Wow. So, no one else has seen so. Ah, okay. Okay, but this is it. So, distributive style is a zero sum game. I either win and you lose nothing. So, I put these characters, Louis Leith and Samantha Wheeler, because that is how they are. That's their, that's their style. And you must lose. That's how distributive style works. It's a compete or die. Now, an integrative style, Memuna, okay, you've seen this, so it's okay, that's cool. Then an integrative style believes in win-win situations, the flexible situation. They always consider other people's needs. They always believe there's my cross because it's a visual representation of an integrative style because he does that. He's if you've watched the series, it's very empath 
empathetic to people's needs. And I think that was the <laughs> that was something that did not that Harvey did not like about him. And then there's mixed motive. It uses the balance of both methods. You can compete and also be empathetic. And that was Harvey Specter. And there's a reason why Harvey Specter was seen as the best. Because I mean he knew how to use both methods effectively. And the book says he said that 42% more value is gained in a deal when zero-sum games are abandoned. So for those of you that would prefer distributive ways of negotiating. <laughs> yeah, so this data, <laughs> exactly, exactly, really, exactly, you get. So Harvey knows how to build um, relationships and maintain them because it's not just about building relationships. He can build them and maintain them. But at the same time, he also knew when he could compete and win without, you know, having a lot of um, um, casualties. So that's that's one thing I enjoyed about Harvey Specter. And that's why I put him as the best visual re representation of mixed motives, because he understood that. My cross was just always leading to empathy. Lewis and Samantha, they don't care who gets hit. They must compete and they must win. That's it. Okay. So a good negotiation looks like this. Uh, both parties are focused on satisfying interests because well, as human beings, we tend to have a lot of things. It's like a cesspool. So we tend to have a lot of things coming in and uh, affecting or distracting the whole process of negotiator of of negotiation. Of, sorry, <laughs> talking so much. Okay, so. Uh, yes, yeah, so both parties should focus on interest. So instead of focusing on, oh, this is what I want, oh, this is what I need, let's bring it down to the basics. Interest. How can I save your interest and how can you save mine? That is what a good negotiation looks like. So we are eliminating the extracurricular, the everything that would become that sex full of distraction. And we're focusing on interests which would allow you to be very rational when you're talking okay a good negotiation looks like this you understand the why of the negotiation why are we here we're here so that both parties can walk away with this we're here so that both of us can discuss and non-negotiables we're here so that we can discuss this so both of us can live here with equal pieces of the pie yeah so it's so there's the acronym that's there, SSEU. You see both sides of the negotiation. You separate the issues. That means any issue that comes up, the risk, everything you see from both sides of the table, you exchange information. Okay, this is what I have to talk about. And this is what you have to talk about. And then we use standards. And what are those standards? They are legal precedents, you know, things that already exist. So instead of coming up with um, saying, oh, this is how I want to do my thing. No, 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 I cannot use your thing. This is how I want to do mine too. So instead of doing all that, you decide, okay, let's work with standards. Now, when there are set standards and precedents, it's easier for both parties to say, okay, you know what, if we are putting our interest by this spectrum, then this is the best way to go. That's how a good negotiation looks. Yeah. So see your um see both sides, bring all your strong points to the table, separate your issues, exchange information, and use standards. Okay, so then more on styles. So as coined by Ned Herman, he said there are four styles that exist for negotiation. There's the rational style because Negotiation involves four things. It involves logic, it involves caution, it involves interaction, and it also involves boldness. So he coined it into four styles. The rational style, that this person is always logical, relies on facts and data. I've always said data is king. This person is always rational. He's always thinking in, um, in a numerical way. 
Now there's the safekeeping person. This person is always cautious. <sighs> How best can I protect myself? They're always very risk averse. They don't take a lot of risk. In fact, for them, risk, if risk can be avoided, they avoid it. And then there's the feeling style. This person relies on human interaction. My cross, still my you know, go-to. Um, this person is very empathetic, likes to build connections, build feelings, you know, interact informally and outside, build rapports, basically develop and publish trust. And the last person is experimental. So this person takes a lot of risk. This person thinks big picture. What's the best thing we can achieve together? That's what this person is. Now, there are some people that have more of rational styles. There are people that are more cautious. There are people that are more in the feeling style. And there are people that are more in the experimental style. So before we go on, I'd like to ask, which style do you think you are? Are you a more rational person? Are you a cautious person? Are you in the feeling spectrum? Or are you experimental? So let's see your styles from, from what we've um, done here. What are your styles? I am blessing all styles. Okay, so everything. So you're 100% on all. Wow, <laughs> that is good. Okay, okay, that's cool. So apart from blessing, who else? Okay, isn't it your, you are experimental and feeling? Okay, I like that, I like that. So you see the big picture and you also like human interactions. Okay, that's great. So who else has um, styles for us? Or oh, th that's what we're stopping for today. Okay. Okay, thank you, Blessing and Ezine. So yes, yeah, so in order to be a very effective negotiator, you need to have a, like all of us have a mix of all this, you get. But there are some people that lean towards more of one. And for effective negotiation, you need to build up on the rest. So if you are someone that is, higher on the feeling spectrum, you need to learn emotional intelligence. You need to learn to regulate your emotions because it's a negotiation. So that means the discussion, that means you're communicating your needs and you will need to ensure that your feelings don't override your decisions. Because like I've said, feelings are very unreliable and you cannot um, get the best out of that discussion or that negotiation if you do not regulate that. And if you're a rational person, as much as like to rely on numbers, there should be a balance. How can you take a risk, you know? Yeah, and if you are very cautious, learn to allow yourself to take more risks. So at the same time, so identify your major style, understand yourself, but at the same time, work on those that you are recessive in. Because negotiation would want you or require you to be very flexible. And you can't be flexible if you are stuck on what you already have. It's very necessary that you do that. Okay, so create win-win deals. So you focus on issues, you get creative and formulate a social um, contract, a contract that is binding on both of you. Learn to create those. So identify and leverage differences. We're human beings, so that means we're complex and also dynamic. So what is the person's strengths and weakness. What are your strengths and weakness? How can you walk through both differences? Also understand what is more important to the other party. That means empathy comes in. We're not saying always rely on empathy or go all the way empathetic. Like I said, strike a balance. You have your needs, but also understand what the other party needs. I know these things might seem so, because as human beings, we always want to win. We never want to win because there is that inner need to always be a step higher. There's a reason we have a past my neighbor generators <laughs> because people just want to be the first, the best, the standard, the this, the that. So negotiation allows you to come to the middle. Both of you have to come to an to a, a, a point, a midpoint, you know. So try to Imagine telling someone at the table that you have to understand what the other person, what's important to the other person. You think you're playing with them. So learn, you have to learn that. So that means there's, a, there's some humility that is needed. So that means you need to cut your ego <laughs> at the negotiation table. 
So develop mutual trust and keep to your commitment. That's also essential because, I mean, both of you, any relationship that you're going to build, if you say you want to build relationships, for those of you that are on the human and feeling spectrum, if you are going to develop that, you need to keep to them. That's one thing I enjoyed having Spectre with because he knows, he understands relationships and he understands that relationships are essential to success. So he knows how to, he knew how to keep them and how to manage them over time and also how to let go of things that were in there. So solidify your reputation. You say you want to build trust and build mutual respect and everything. How do you solidify that if you don't even keep to, um, the commitments and things that you say you are. You say you're going to be at place by eight, be at place by eight. You say, oh, I'm going to take out this thing because I want us to work together in the future. Then do that. Don't go behind and then kill that. It becomes, it's, your reputation is, it sells you. So you can, you need to solidify your reputation because if someone is going to do business with you and they hear about your reputation or not even hear, but maybe what they've experienced is you not living up to something you told them you do. It becomes the problem and it, that becomes shaky. Yeah. Then negotiate fairly. Think equality. How can we both get um, equal parts of this um, of this pie? Then think equity. Um, how can we get the best the best out of it based on what we've contributed and then address your needs. Be clear with your needs, be consistent and have a consensus. So it's very important, CF. And then create a fairness frame because what may seem, we're human beings. So we tend to have uh, subjective definitions of what we think fairness is. So instead of allowing that um, human element to affect what we will call a fairness frame, we run it through, run it through that, create a frame that appeals to both of you. So work with that, what will satisfy the both of you, what is justifiable, so legal precedents and all that, and then what is the simple enough um, decision and simple enough high that uh, both of you can reach. And, you know, with all that, you can create win-win deals for both of you. So. Thank you so much. Uh, this is where I drop the mic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Isn't it? This is amazing right now. Amazing. Ua, I mean, at this point, we should just call it a day and just Isn't be done. Me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, okay. Can hear you. okay. There was yeah, my, my computer yeah. just, just went all woozy. I thought we should just call it a day and just go because we've learned. I mean, I don't know if you were not taking notes. I, I don't know what you were doing because I was taking notes and there were just amazing nuggets that Ua just kept on dropping and I'm like, ah, is it the same book that we read? Because the things that she was bringing, the insight she was bringing, are like, ah, okay. I like, I love, you know, there are certain things I took note of, you know, there are things she talked about strategy, she talked about counter moves, um, she talked about, you know, when you're a negotiator, you're, you're a gladiator in the battlefield. Yes, you're not there to fight, but you're there in the battlefield. And then something she kept on emphasizing, balance. And that is all through the book. You know, you can come from either end of the spectrum, but then it's best if you're, in, if you're going to be a master negotiator, you're going to have to understand the um, the, the concept of balance. So Uwa, thank you so much for that. I mean, I was engrossed the whole time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we will go on to, so Uwa talked about pre preparing for negotiation and talked about setting your style. So now we're going to proceed to chapter three, chapters three and four, which speak to conduct. So chapter three talks about conducting negotiations. And anytime I think about negotiations, like Uwa talks about strategy, I think about the game of chess. You know how you're sitting down facing your, your opponent and there's that intensity. You're looking at the person, you're studying the person to determine what the next move that person is going to make. And the person is watching you. Negotiation is just a game. It's like a game of chess. 
And to succeed, you need to have a strong position. You need to know how to deal with sticky situations. You need to know how to influence your counterpart, which speaks to understanding you know, human behavior, because if you don't understand human behavior, how can you influence the other person? And then at the end of it, you need to, you know, know how to close the deal. You don't, you won't leave the deal open-ended. It needs to be closed. And power is so important in determining the outcome of negotiations. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't have power to, to enter into such negotiations, but it's a, it's a great tool to have. It's a great thing to leverage on if you have power. Um, uh, it is also, like I said, it's also important to know how to negotiate even when you don't have power. So you might say, you know, like in the workplace, oh, I may not have, I'm not in the position to influence things, but the authors are saying that even when you don't have power, you can, there are certain things you can leverage on, you know, to, to uh, successfully close your negotiations. First off is if you have a good alternative to the negotiated agreement, it gives you the power to say no to a bad deal. So take kissing points, you know, less as you, because you know, when we talk about negotiations, sometimes people all, what people, the first thing people's mind goes to is when you're discussing salaries and, you know, promotions and all that. If you're in a, in a job conversation, a job interview and all that, if you are desperate, you're very likely to fall for the, or, or, or be inclined to take the deal, no matter what it is, because they're like, ah, you know, whatever they offer me, you know, I'll get. But if you have an alternative, you're so likely to, you know, um, to ponder and think about it and decide, am I going to take it? So that's where the power comes. You have the leverage to decide whether you're going to take that offer or not. Uh, so the less desperate you are for that deal, the more power you have not to settle for it. If I have an alternative, if I'm offered a job and I know that, you know what, I have another alternative, I don't have to settle for this thing. I don't have to settle for what you're giving to me because it's 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 it it, it for me it doesn't meet my value. It's not of any value to me. Yeah, but if I'm in a tight spot, I don't have an alternative. Then there's a problem. Then I might be more inclined to take it. I might be more inclined to take it whether it's crumbs that are being offered to me or not. Yeah. So and then it also says that even if you don't have power, if your side, if if your side has more resources, then you you're you're at an advantage. And when it talks about resources, it doesn't only necessarily mean money. Yes, some people, you know, it could be that you have more resources in terms of finances. It could be that you have more resources in terms of people. You have more people on your side. You have a leverage. It could also be that you have more information. You have no knowledge. That puts you at an advantage. So you may not necessarily be powerful, influential, but because you have that advantage of having more information, that gives you more leverage over that negotiation, right? It says that even if you don't have power, don't let the other party know that you're weak. Because remember, Uwa said something about laying your not laying all your cards on the table. If your other, if the other party sees that you're weak, you're in trouble. You know, they will just swoop in and then, you know, go for the kill. You have to make sure that you keep that under wraps. Identify whatever areas of strength that you have and use that as a leverage. And we talked about it. Are you more knowledgeable? You know, what is it that you have that you can use as a leverage? Some people actually use likability. You know, you just get into a place and people just like you. You can use that as a, as, as your leverage in your negotiations. You know, I may not have all the money. I may not have all the knowledge. But, you know, where I go to, people like me. Uh, if integrity, there are some people that, you know, they're just known that their yes is their yes and their no is their no. And they have respect for that. So they have respect because of that. And so you can use that as a leverage. So what, what is your strength? What is that thing that you can hang on to? Even if you don't, you seemingly don't have the power, but that thing, that trait that you have, you can leverage on, use it to your advantage in your negotiations, right? Then experts suggest that you should allow the other party make the first offer. Don't be the first, don't allow, don't, don't deal your hand first. Allow them make that first offer. However, skilled negotiators are, you know, a bit iffy about it, like, mm, should you? You know, it's it's a debate. But there's been suggestions that, you know, let them make the first offer. It's not set in stone. However, you know, you can make a first offer if you're confident of your standing. But allowing them to make the first offer just gives you that chance to make a counter offer. You know, and it sets the ball um, rolling in your negotiation uh, conversations. Now, I remember Uwa talked about it, that when you're going into a negotiation, don't go into it to win or to, you know, it's not about all winning. It's what goes, what happens beyond that agreement, what happens beyond that discussion. Look towards having a long-term relationship, right? And so if you're looking to have a long-term relationship with the other party, then don't jump at the first offer that they make. Don't, whether it's a generous offer, don't jump at it. 
just creates an opportunity for there to be a counter offer that will result in a win-win for you. Ua also talked about it, that a good negotiation is a, is a negotiation where two of you walk out of that deal and both of you are happy. So you don't want to go into a deal and you're like, you know what, I don't care whose ox is God. I'm just going to, I want to win and I don't care about the other person. No, because it goes beyond that. You know, you want to build something long-term. So wouldn't you rather that both of you come out of that room and you're, you're satisfied? So, yeah. Now, um, negotiators say that there are different pers persuasion techniques that can be used during nego um, um, negotiation. Uh, the first one is using scarcity. You can, you can in presenting your offer, you can tell people about the benefits that you're offering that they cannot get anywhere else. And you see it, you see it play out, you know, even on the ads that you watch. You know, you're watching ads, those are negotiations. They're telling you, they're trying to convince you, oh, buy, um, co them over this, right? Or if you do, if you buy this, it's going to give you this. Yeah, you're not going to get it from this other product. It's a negotiation. So when you're going to negotiation table, what are the things, what are the benefits you can offer that they won't see anywhere else? And that will probably build them into, you know, um, agreeing to your negotiation. And then another technique is gain commitment. You can have them commit to, um, to that negotiation, you know, however, using your leverage, leveraging or whatever it is, your integrity or whatever, with that, you're able to tie in that agreement. Again, another uh, option is to give a reason. Now, there was a stat that I that the book that the author said. They said ninety four percent of people will. Have Oh. Hello, can you hear me now? Bluetooth. Can you hear me now? You can hear me now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, the network is unstable, but yeah, we'll, we'll power through. Okay. So I was talking about um a reason. I said, you know, I talked about, you know, how the percentage of people that will give you will agree to a request if you give a reason. So if I walked into an office, at my manager's office, and said I want a promotion, and they say why, if I just say I want a promotion just because, they they will look at me like you must be joking. But if I give a reason, they are likely to listen to me to even give me a listening ear, right? They're likely to even just at least give me audience. You know, then talk less of giving a very cogent reason. In fact, the stats went further and said 93% of people will agree to a reason, even if it doesn't hold water. So you must have a reason in your persuasion techniques. You must give a reason for why you want to come to an agreement in your negotiations. Then give social proof. Demonstrate how your product has been successfully used by others, right? If you're in the office, you know, who I talked about data, you know, being rational, being a rational negotiator. So if you're being a rational negotiator, you must bring proof. There must be stats. There must be numbers. You must prove and say, oh, well, we did this. When we implemented this, this these were the results. So, and this, this was successful, blah, 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 blah. This is why we should do this. That will make the person on the other side of the table listen to you and say, oh, okay, you have a point. Okay, yeah, right? Then another uh, technique is to allow them to say no. It's saying, make a, an outrageous demand and then let them say no. And then go back and then come back with a, a, a reasonable demand. So it's like a back and forth. And for me, what comes to my mind when I hear this is, you know, when you go to the market and you want to buy something from, I used to do that a lot when I was younger. Somebody, I was taught, I think my cousin taught me, said, when you want to buy something, you know, and they ask you, okay, how much do you want to buy it? I should just say something crazy and then, you know, they'll, you know, and then they're like, no, uh, how can, uh, how much is this meat? Okay, give it to me for 2000 uh, No, madam, I can't give it to you. Then you start bargaining and then until you come to an agreement, this is the same principle with the negotiation. Say something crazy and then, you know, you step back and then come back with a reasonable amount. That sets the tone for the conversation. It will make the other party obligated to make a concession for you because you have set the ball rolling. You have actually started a conversation and you're holding them you're you're also getting them permitted right then he also says set a benchmark benchmark you can influence that decision by setting a benchmark for them and saying okay this is the threshold this is where we're going to go this is where we're going to 
um, have this agreement stop at. And yeah, those are ways that you can um, persuade the other party to reach an agreement with you. Now, there may be times in your in your negotiation discussions that you may reach, you may reach a deadlock and impasse. How do you deal with that, right? Don't run away. Don't walk away. It's not a loss. You there, there are ways that you can go around, you know, the impasse. So first of all, take a step back and pull off. You have to think about it, right? You you can't just delve into it immediately. You have to take step step back and think about it. Then you can come back to resume your discussions later. Now, at the point of reconvening, you can now map out your mutual benefits. Of course, you have to anticipate and plan in advance. Uwa talks about preparation. So you're going to have to think about the possible outcomes of this negotiation, the possibility that, you know, it's not going to, it's going to come to a deadlock. What are you going to do when that deadlock happens? So you have to anticipate and prepare for it. And then when it happens, be flexible with finding creative solutions. Don't be set in stone. Oh, it has to be this way or it's not going to happen. No, when you're doing renegotiations, you have to be flexible, right? Don't think that all deadlocks will end unsuccessfully. Like I said, you're going to a negotiation, not necessarily with, yo, know, I have to win it or I, I'm going to lose. No, you have to go into it with a win-win um, mindset. Then use your emotional intelligence because this is the time. This is the time that calls for emotional intelligence. This is not the time to be all up in your feelings. You're going to have to think about calming yourself in the situation and thinking straight, thinking beyond your feelings. Even if you know people are heated up, you're going to have to be calm in the situation and think things through logically. Now it said something, and I put that you know in bold. It said, interestingly, twelve percent greater profits are achieved over a meal. You might this. So when you get a deadlock, you might just want to just cool off and say, you know what, guys, let's go and have lunch or let's go and have drinks. And that's that's what um Uwa was talking about when she talks about, you know, I think it's I you know I stand corrected, but you guys tend to do this a lot. You know, where they have deals and they 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 they, they close deals over drinks. So you see them at night. They are this nightclub or they are this joint, they are closing deals because everybody's mind is has come down. Who knows what would have transpired earlier, right? Maybe they've reached deadlocks, maybe they've been heated discussions, but then when they are there, everybody, you know, their guards are lowered. Then you see them signing multi-million naira deals. I mean, stats are saying you said, you know, you get better profits achieved over a meal. So who knows? That might be something you might want to bring up, you know, uh, in the process of a negotiation that is hooking you in the neck for want of a better word. Now to avoid being trapped, avoid taking the first offer that is made to you. You know, don't just grab at it because it also reeks of desperation. You want to think about it and negotiate a little, you know, don't, don't put yourself out as you're desperate. You want to like mm, do a bit of, you know, in a local parliament, shakara, you want to, you know, be like, and then, put, but you have to be careful because you also don't want to negotiate yourself off the table, right? So you have to understand the balance and understand where, you know, you, you, you are doing that negotiation, know when to, you know, reel in and know when to step back. Yeah. Now, the, the, the decision making strategies that you can take, so you can reverse your original decision, which is what I said. I said, don't, don't let everything be set in stone. You don't have to have, oh, it has to happen this way. And you have to be creative. So you can reverse your original decision and cut your losses. And then plan your exit. Where, if you get to a point where the, the this negotiation doesn't seem to be going anywhere, you can plan an exit. You know, you they say you live to fight another day, right? You can take a step backwards and, you know, resume a negotiation another day instead of it getting into um, something that might become messy. Um then you can also look through the eye of a trusted expert to challenge your overconfidence in your negotiation abilities. Who I talked about it said, don't be overconfident. And we're going to delve deeper into that in chapter four. You might want to look through the eyes of someone who's better at these things. Let them test you and see your capabilities as, as a negotiator. Because you may think that you're a great negotiator. And then someone looking at you will say, you know, who would have observed you and said, nah, yeah, nah, this, these are your blind spots. This is what you need to do better and all that. And then ensure that your offer is backed by a solid research. Who I talked about this. Do your research, get your facts, get your stats, get your data, get your figures. Don't just come there unknowledgeable because you don't know what the other party has over you. So you have to come to the table correct. And then approach each negotiation uniquely. The way you do a negotiation with this person doesn't is not necessarily going to play out the same with this person. So you may not necessarily use the same approach in different negotiations. So know how to be creative and to be quick thinking, to know, to be adaptable. You know, Uwa talked about that too in the earlier chapters. 
adaptable and flexible to, to deal with the situations at hand. Um, effective negotiators try to synchronize their behavior with the other person. And every time I see this, I think I, I read this, I think about chess. You know, when you're you're studying the other person, you're watching their moves, you're seeing the pattern with which they're doing. It's the same thing when you're in a negotiation, you know, in any kind of negotiation, you're 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 in a way mirroring the other person's mood. If you're if you're really in it, you're watching how the person, you know, does the negotiation and like, hmm, 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 observing observing that person's pattern and then you might start to you know mirror or synchronize with that person's behavior um some negotiators believe that showing their emotions to the other party makes them vulnerable and that's what we're talking about don't lay all your cards on the table they instead they, they instead prepare to put, uh, put a poker face so that poker face is like putting a straight face you know what i'm here i don't have time to play I, i'm not going to smile with anybody i'm here for business but in some cases, that is not that may not work particularly, which is why you should have a balance. In fact, some even believe in using anger, where they come as if they are fighting, you know, because they want to intimidate people, right? So that the other person will cave in, but it may not necessarily, it may not pan out that way for you. Um, the other, some other schools of thought think believe that you should come, you know, very positive, nice and cheery, because that might have the other party, you know, um, um, succumb to your to your offer. It may work, it may not work, yeah? But 85% of your success in negotiation is based on your ability to understand human behavior. So you see how high those ratings are, how you see how, how important it is, you know, when you're going into negotiations to understand human behavior. And it speaks to like, if you're going to negotiate, you're going to ask for something. You have to understand the person you're going to ask this thing for. You won't go when, you know, there's some people that you go into them, you go to them at a particular time, whatever you say, whether you bring the facts and figures, they will tell you a big flat out no. And there's some, you know, and there's sometimes you may get to that person or you come to the person and the person is open to listen to whatever you say. So you have to understand the behavior of the other party before you bring a deal to the table. So you know the right time to plug in that, you know, that offer, yeah? So that you get results, the best, uh, the best results. It says regulate your emotions. Uwa talks about said, even me, people like me that are feelers, we need to know how to regulate our feelings so that we don't allow those feelings to overtake us and also find ways to empathize with the other party. Now, the other party may decide to come with their own game, right? Competitive tactics. They want to, they want to, they want to uh, knock you off guard, be ready for those. And then he talked about them, said, like when the, the other party comes with a very high offer or it comes with a really low offer, they want to knock you off guard. How do you deal with that? Stay grounded. And there was something Uwa said, he said, you know, know what you want. If you're coming to a negotiation table, already have your mindset on what you want. What is it that you want? Have it at the back of your mind and stay resolute in that thing. Yes, there may be times that you may need to negotiate um, to, to um, be flexible, to say, okay, you know what? But try as much as possible, you know, see through the, you know, if it's a game that the other party is bringing that they're going to say, okay, you know what? We're going to give you a very low offer and then they want to throw you off board. Just have your threshold, have your benchmark and know that, okay, Beyond this, I'm not going to go beyond this. Yes, I I have room to 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 um bend a bit, but beyond this, I'm not going to go because sometimes they use it as tactics to just sweep you off your feet. Another thing is playing good bad guy. They want to play good cop bad cop. You know, you're the, you're the good person. I'm the bad person, or they're the they're the bad person. You're the good person. They're saying stay focused on protecting your interests because all those things are just to distract you from the main goal then you know they may come with time they may try to pressure you say oh you need we need to agree on this thing quickly now 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 or we have one week or we have two days so no 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 don't allow them put you under pressure use your own discretion to decode whether a timeline is real or not because they will they, sometimes they come with those timelines to you know put you in a corner just to make a decision oh okay we're offering this to you we need you to make this decision immediately if you don't make decision and then you have to think you have to think about it and say uh, is this real or you know um, this person is just trying to push me to a corner and this also speaks to understanding human behavior because if you do you'll be able to see through the gimmicks another um another competitive tactic that they use is separating the issues now if you're dealing with multiple issues right they may decide to separate the issues so it says the author says no when you're dealing with multiple issues just negotiate them all at once so that you can get an all-round deal 
then they may come from the point of emotional back blackmail and they don't want to do this thing to you so they now make you to feel start to feel bad you know they will start to appeal to your emotions making you feel guilty it says no stay calm and center that's where you have to regulate your emotions take control of your emotions and make sure to steer the negotiation back on track you know somebody and the person is trying to make you feel guilty the person is crying or you know mm -mm, you were here this is what we're here for and stay focused on that then there's another tactic called nibbling where they may try to give you a small concession at the last minute yeah uh, okay we may not be able to give you this but let's give you this mm -mm, don't budge on the small concession yeah because um because that may push you that may that may miss help that may make you miss your mark that may make you um be distracted from your goal so just be focused on what you want what you're there for and don't allow see through the gimmicks and don't allow them get you um distracted from your main goal which is to negotiate your deal and come to an agreement a win-win situation for you all closing the deal is the most critical part of the negotiation process it's not about outcomes you don't it's not about oh i won or oh, i lost it's about building relationships i mean we cannot overemphasize this so treat the closing as a beginning as a start of a collaboration between the both parties don't let either party overcommit. Don't overcommit. Don't make promises that you cannot keep. And of course, the agreement should be written, right? When it's written, it's it's it bonds better. Don't have any verbal um uh, agreements. Make sure that they're documented. However, even if they're documented, be flexible enough to leave room for change because you know things may come up, you know, along the way. So that's that for chapter we go to chapter four chapter four was really the most interesting part for me maybe because it delved into international negotiations it was so interesting you know the cultural nuances that were talked about in it i really loved it, it was it, it just brought everything to life for me and so we're going to go into that and chapter four talks about developing your technique so it, talk, it first of all delves on negotiating as a team. So the earlier chapters we've talked about, you it may be you negotiating as an individual, but then when you're negotiating as a team, right? Because some deals are too complex for one person to take on, right? And it, it demands a diverse set of abilities. Now, working with a team brings more effective results, but it requires a lot of com coordination. And of course, the smooth movement of communication. You guys need to be on top of your communication because any little slip, things can just go crumbling down. So make sure you prep your strategy as a team before entering into negotiations. And then there was this sentence that I highlighted that, you know, caused a little bit of a ruffle in the group, you know, where we talked about, it said, the author said 3% of men in negotiations lied to men, but 24% lied to women, which is why it speaks to all the author. I think the author is, is not explicitly suggesting, but it's implying that when you're creating the team, the team should be diverse. So it will do you better to have a, a team that is well with gender balanced. Because as you can see here, sometimes the women don't see through the men's um, gimmicks. So it, you know it's easier for the, the men to just, the men on the other side and the other parties to just throw the women off and they probably won't see through it. But if you have men in your team, you, your team is balanced the men can figure the men out. They see each other like, yeah, we see what you're doing. So they're able to say, ah, yeah. You know, so they can't, they can't pull the fleece over. They can't pull the wool over your eyes. So you, you, it's good to have the diverse team in terms of gender, in terms of capability, whatever, however way you can make your team diverse, you know, throw in that mix so that you're able to go to that negotiation well equipped. Now, making a decision as a negotiation team comes in three ways. The first is on a unanimity, where all team members must agree on a given issue. It is tough and it's not recommended because we are because it's diverse. We cannot all agree on the same thing, yeah. Um, and of course, the, the negotiation experts do not recommend it. So let's go further and see which one is better or which ones are better. Then there's the majority rule. Um, of course, as it says, the majority will carry the votes, right? But the, the issue here is that if majority carries the vote, what happens to the minority? They are not happy with the decision. So you have a set of people that are unhappy, then you have a set of people that are happy. So fine, that's there. Let's go to the last one, which is the consensus. And as the name suggests, everybody agrees fully to an end game that they will live with. So it's in this case, the difference is that with the unanimity, they all agree on a given issue, right? 
in this last one, they, everybody may not agree, but they just agree on, you know, okay, fine, let's close this. Deal. They agree to the end, the closing of the deal. And everybody leaves that with a win. It's a win-win situation for everybody. It may not, the satisfaction may not be at the same level, but everybody has left with a win on each side, right? Now, the advantages of a team negotiation is that it gives it gives room for various trade-offs. You can have different, you know, it's not just one. You can have different alternatives, you know, to the close to close your deal, right? And because there's strength in numbers, if I go to a negotiation table and I have my team with me, I there's an empowerment that comes. I feel I feel secure. I feel strong. I'm like, yeah, nobody. I'm invincible because I have we have many voices. And of course, it sends a message to the other party. Remember where I talked about leveraging on your strength. So if I'm coming to my if I'm coming to the table with a, a team of people, uh, uh even if I don't know it all. The fact that I have a group of people with me, that already gives me some confidence, which may knock off the other team that may not have as much people as I do. Now, what are the pitfalls of team negotiation? Working within a team may lead to lack of focus, they, which is why, you know, when you're do, working with the team, you need to still have a lead negotiator, someone who stirs the ship, right? And of course, we need to agree on everybody's roles and responsibilities. So the fact that there's a lead, lead negotiator does not mean that other people should slack. Everybody will have what is expected of them, what their responsibilities are. But then with team negotiations, there's, there's a tendency to fall into groupthink. Everybody is thinking the same thing. Yeah. So that's why you have to encourage diverse thinking. You have to encourage, at some point, you even have to encourage good conflict, you know, where people are, you know, voicing out their opinions. Of course, you're not fighting per se, but then there's a diversity of opinions. And then also avoid the us. As good so when you're going to negotiation, you're going with your team, avoid that, oh, we're the good people versus the bad people. It's not necessarily like that. It's not the good cop versus the bad cop. Two of you may be the good people, right? Um, you So because the, at the end of the day, the end game is to create, remember we talked about, it's not just about closing the deal, but you're trying to create further collaboration. You're trying to co create long-term relationships. So you're not going as if you're going to battle. You're going as if you're going to, you know, do it, you know, shake hands at a deal and then move forward with other, you know, collaborations down the line. Now, um, negotiating in this context requires a lot of dexterity and awareness of the constant, the possible pitfalls, right? Um, and it says complexities can take on different forms. You can, you, you need, first of all, you need to be strategic. So to be well prepared, you need to assess your and the other party's partner. Ua explained what partner was. Partner is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So you must have your alternatives. Okay, fine. If this this alternative does not fall through, what is the best alternative? So you need to, you know, reassess. You know, take it through, think it through, and decide. You know, check it, check the 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 loopholes, whatever it is, and make sure you you know it's it's well padded, it's well it's well covered. And then there's also social complexity. Uh, complexity in understanding and building your relationships. You must not you must learn not to give into your social pressure and protect your interests. In in all of this, while you're doing negotiations, you must always protect your interests. You must, it's very important because as as the other party, as you are protecting your interests, the other party is protecting their interests. Yes, you're going in there to collaborate, but then your interests are also important, paramount. And then there's emotional complexity. Now it can be very taxing to do multi-party negotiations. So all it's it's very important to have your emotional intelligence, you know, on on you know up you know on on par. You must keep your emotions in in check because your emotions, if your emotions are affected, it can affect your decision making. If you're angry, if you get upset at the way the, everything is proceeding, it can it can alter your decision making. So make sure that you keep calm, you keep your emotions in check. Of course, be assertive as possible, you know. It's, this is not the time for silence because your silence may be misinterpreted as assent. So talk. You know, if you have a problem with how the agreement is going or whatever, speak out your mind because nobody can, they can't read minds and they cannot tell. But if you don't say anything, they would assume that you're agreeing to what has been discussed on the table. Now, there's also informational uh, complexity. Now, there's so much information flying back and forth because it's multi party agreements, right? Um, it is important to have a solid information system where all this information is collated and documented so that you can manage it, you can access it at, at any time, because information can fly over your head and you can lose sight of that information. So document it for reference at different points in time. Then there's procedural 
complexity. Now to bring structure to the um, negotiation, it is recommended that an expert is brought in to facilitate the process more effectively, especially when it's a multi-party agreement, you might need to bring in an expert to now, you know, make sure that everything goes well. Now, when they are dealing with a multi-party, when you're doing multi-party negotiations, it's there are opportunities to form coalitions. Well, collaborations, coalitions. Um, so yeah, when to protect your interests, it is advantageous for you to plan in advance about building a winning coalition as well as putting together a defense. So as much as you're building a, a, a winning coalition, you also have to, you know, be ready, you know, in case there's pushback. So you're 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 like a soldier going out to battle. You're going to attack attack when i say attack though it's not you know attack in the in the bad way but then you're also ready to defend you know you should be you should be ready with those two um um uh, approaches now there are three factors to consider when building a coalition that's what the author says it says first of all the issue of agreement you would need to meet a middle ground a, a middle ground as to the strategies you intend to use to achieve your goals make it clear to your partners how the benefits will be divided you have to let them know make it clear, plain to them and of course the division the benefits may not be divided equally but just make sure that the division is fair then to influence leverage on the influence of some of your partners there's some people in your team that may be more influential than the other please leverage on their uh, their influence to help you push your goal you may have someone who's very powerful who has a network of people who can be please leverage on that as much as possible because essence you're protecting your interests you're there to to close a deal so leverage on the strengths that you have then trust i mean why be in a team when you don't trust them yeah so you have to be with people whoever your potential partners are going to be whoever the members of your public coalition coalition are are going to be you have to trust them and then in recruiting coalition partners there were a number of questions the the authors asked, but I picked a few that resonated with me. Said, the recru should the recruitment of potential partners be sequenced? So if I'm going to recruit many partners, can I do them all at a time or do they have to be done one after the other? You're the one that will decide that. And then do you know the best way to approach them? So the way I will approach um, Uwa might be different from the way I, I approach Yemi. So you have to think about the best way to get them to be in your team. Now, focus on those that are aligned with you, who are trustworthy, and who aren't in positions of power currently, because you can build those people. Those people can, you know, as they work with you, they can, you know, eventually increase their levels of power. And before you, so and it's even better that they're growing with you, you know, that way you have, um, you have loyalty, you have them more in tune or inclined or entrenched with you, right? Um, once identified, once you identify your partners, ask them to publicly commit to this coalition to make it harder for them to, you know, reflect the agreement. Now, this is the part that was very interesting to me, negotiating internationally. So we've talked about negotiation, right? Maybe on the local level or on other levels. Now, going into international negotiations is a totally different ball game altogether because you're dealing with different things and it, it, there are lots of complexities, complexities. And these complexities could include things like Currency fluctuations, as we know, you know what we've experienced in Niger we've been experiencing in Nigeria. You have the dollar naira rates fluctuating, so you're going into a country that things are not stable, right? You're 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 going to deal with that. So these are things you need to take into um, consideration. Cultural nuances, the bargaining power of the parties, the relevant stakeholders, and then government uh, control. So th these things, these areas are places that you might experience significant differences now let's talk about agreements now western negotiators are more inclined to finish up the, the process with a bullet clad detailed contract however the asian counterparts are not really concerned about you know too much verb you know verbose contracts they do that does not concern them they just want to have their their agreements are less substantial you know, they just want, there are certain things that are more important to them than having a, a well-documented contract. So you need to think about, you know, take note of these things when you're going to um, negotiations. And when I say this, so like people like us that I, that have gone into, have done recruitment, if you're recruiting for um, expatriates and you're recruiting for Nigerians, there's a difference. And I'll come to, I'll give you some exact examples. Now, in, some, in, in terms of time sensitivity, some countries are very strict with time. They're very, they, look, 
if we are going to meet and we're going to have this negotiation meeting at two o'clock, you need to be there by 1.50. But in some other um, countries, you know how we say here, African time, you know, in some other countries, they don't, they are very lax about it. Like it's not important. In fact, there was an example of India that they don't, they take their time. They're not crazy about, uh, they, you know, they're not crazy about keeping to time. In fact, if you pressurize them, you have, you are very, you are, you are at risk of losing the deal. So just give them their time. Just let them take the time that they need. Yes, of course, they may, you may you may put a timeline, but you know try as much as possible not to be so stiff with it or else you may knock the person off. So you need to take into consideration these things when you're dealing with different countries uh, or people from those different countries with their different nuances. Now, degree of formality. In informal cultures, negotiations are more relaxed, unlike informal cultures. Like if you go to the Western world, you know, you're talking with people, you're calling them first name basis, whatever age you are, you're 22, you're calling a 70 something year old. Hey, Rick, hey, Owen, you're in Nigeria. You come here, you want to go into negotiation table. And then as a, a 22 year old person, you call that CEO, Rick, uh, or Sheung, that one is already that's already um a note down for you you know they're looking at you like oh really so you have to be conscious of the cultural nuances before you walk into uh, a negotiation uh, table i was reading about japan how you know they're very they're quite formal with um with their dealings you know they have to in fact if you have to do a negotiation with them you can't just walk straight to, to the person you're having a negotiation with to, to 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 close the deal or have discussions no you have to do it through a third party but in the western world you don't walk up to but hey you know give the person a shake hey what's up in fact you can talk about the weather and before you know it you're signing deals so these are things that you need to take into consideration now there are factors to consider in international negotiations one of which is political risk now you're doing an international uh, negotiation with a, in a country that the political climate is unstable right <laughs> you know that you know your 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 deals are my you know they're they're subject to their their risk they're at risk because you may be in a country or you may be negotiating with a country today that is on the verge of war tomorrow they may say something and say oh everything all their air, air space is closed up whatever and that now puts a damp dampener on your deal so you need to understand the political um uh climate of that country you're going to understand the political risks then there's ideology in the u.s you know, their ideology is that businesses are there to serve the interests of the stakeholder. Unlike in the in Asia, where their businesses are there to serve the greater good. The business is there for the people, you know. You know, the US is that, you know, cut the like, hey, 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 we're not all about that. You know, are we making money for our stakeholders? That's all, I mean, our shareholders, that's what we want to know. So you, these are things that you need to take into consideration when you're entering into any negotiations or discussions with people from these different countries. Again, culture. I've talked about cultural nuances. Different cultural differences will impact the way you need to approach a negotiation. Then that's international finance. We've talked about a cut, you know, currency fluctuation. Like someone coming to do a negotiation with someone in Nigeria and you're doing your negotiation based on Naira. Hmm. Anybody that did that between December and now, you know, you, you can imagine the losses or whatever that they may have made because things were not have not been stable. So you need to understand, you know, how that fluctuation in currency affects the risk to you. Then bureaucracy. There are some countries that, you know, it requires a lot of bureaucracy. There's so much paperwork for you to come and if you want to open a business, you want to do a, you want to carry out a transaction in the country. There's so much, there are layers and layers of things that you have to do. And then in some countries, you just walk in and you're able to do, you know, you're able to do a transaction and it's easy. So understand the different Re, uh, business regulations or government regulations of a country then of course there's political and legal system different countries with different labor laws um, policies and incentives for attracting business investments for example you know um if you go to ghana i think in, in ghana if you want to open up a business you have you have to, there's a certain percentage of your of your management that has to be Ghanaian or else yeah, you're talking, you know, you you have not started. And then in, in South Africa, there's a triple B, triple E, you know, that where there's focus on, there's a certain percentage 
you know, every company has to have with regards to triple B, triple E in terms of supply chain, recruitment and all that, you know, if you don't meet those levels, then other business will not even do, they will not even want to do business with you because you have not met the ratings. And it's the same thing. There's also that playing out in, you know, in Nigeria, in oil and gas, NCDMB, you know, um, where, you know, um, there are certain roles that expatriates cannot fill. You know, because you have to prove to the government that you have not found a Nigerian that is competent enough to fill that role. So those are things, those are negotiations, those are things when you're having, if you have a recruitment drive and you want to bring in someone and then you want to bring in, you know, certain people for certain roles and then you maybe you're operating within the oil and gas industry. You have to be aware of those regulations before you just bring in people and then you waste, you flouted the rules, you waste money and then you, maybe you have to play, pay penalties because you do not meet those rules. Yeah. And so we there was a case study that was given in um about Asia, negotiating in Asia. And that was very interesting. Um it said something, it said the best negotiators move slowly and don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. You can't read, you know, don't expect that anybody can read your mind. So that's why we talked earlier about speaking out. Say say out what you want, say out what you think, say what you want, you know, don't assume. And then of course move this move slowly you don't have to just quickly you know we talked about don't accept the first offer study the other party study their lang their body language study how they behave you know so that you're able to conclude your deals successfully now in asian style of negotiation there's something called once guanzi it's about relationships so the asian people are very big on relationships right they invest and lean heavily into interpersonal connections and then they build a dependable social network which is called the guanji right and they prefer to do business within their trusted network so you can't just walk in you know as a stranger and do business unlike in the western climate you know in the western countries we don't know you from anywhere are you competent you know do you are you qualified eligible to do the deal we'll do the deal with you but these ones are more family oriented they want to know you they want to have established some trust with you before you know they can decide you know that they want to do anything with you then the asians are able to keep their emotions in check based on a confucian teaching uh called shimping tua right which means being perfectly calm. So they're able to maintain their calm in any chaos. They're just there, calm, right? And it, it, it makes their Western counterparts unable to read them. So with whatever is happening, so you can be in a deal with somebody and you don't even know that what, what the person is thinking, whether that person is going to agree or not. They're just calm because they build themselves that way. So you need to understand these things before you get into any uh, transactions or interactions with them. And I speak like, from HR point of view, if you're a HR person, you're dealing with an expert from this country, you know, that person's a staff of yours, or you have, you're, you're on the, on the board of people, you know, your business and you're having, you're doing any business deals with, with these people. These are the things that you need to look out for so that you can help steer your company to, you know, close out successful negotiations. Then the Asian people are all about fairness. They believe that he who has more should give to those who have less. Then they trust from their hearts, Right. They would rather deal with a trustworthy person than a faceless organization. That's why if you have to do business with them, with them, you have to build into their trust. Then there's something else they talked about. Okay, before I talk, go to the face, I was I was talking to said I was going to give you an example. I remember I worked somewhere and we were doing um we were doing a lot of uh, manning up for a big project, and we needed expertise, and that expertise we really needed it from. Um, the, the people that were experts in that field or in those fields were from India and from, um, they were either Filipinos or Indians. And I remember that when we would, you know, we would hire other people, you're hiring an American, you're hiring a British person, as long as the contract is great, the, the, the T's and C's are fantastic. They're like, you know, they'll ask their questions and make sure that they've ticked all the boxes and everything. And I'm like, great, I'm on the plane to Nigeria. Even if they've never been to Nigeria before, they're happy to come and have adventure and come and work. But then the Indian people were more, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Indian people, even the Filipinos, they were a bit more cautious. So we had to look for creative ways to get, because we needed these people, we needed their expertise. So what we would do was we would call, you know, after having the technical interview, we would call on Indian staff that we had to sit in on an informational interview with them. And then it was, most times it was when they now heard, talk to those people that were their Indian um, counterparts, they would now say, oh, okay, you know, that would soften their mind and make them more comfortable with deciding to come to Nigeria because it was trust. They, they could trust the person that is like them. 
you know, we, they don't know us, but this person is, ah, is a fellow Indian, a fellow Filipino, so I can read it better. In fact, some of them wanted to come on family status or maybe they didn't want to come at first, but when the Indian people talk to them and say, hey, I'm here with my wife, I'm here with my children, like, ah, okay, okay, okay. So that built their trust. And that was a negotiation. So we're at the point of negotiating, but we had to bring in trust. We had to bring in the trust factor to help us successfully close the deal. Then there's something else called face. Face in the Asian culture is about dignity and um, an image. They are very particular. It's, it's such an important etiquette in their in the Asian psyche. They want they anything that will make them lose face can make you know can thwart your deal. If you come and you you do something to offend them to make them lose their face lose face, you know it's 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 enough to thwart the deal. So you have to understand that you know it, 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 you have to make sure that you do things to help them save face. Right. So and these are again, the face is gained when individuals behave morally and achieve accomplishments. So if you're someone that's known that they see or have grown to see or trust that you behave morally and you have accomplishments, then they are more likely to want to do uh, transactions or negotiations with you. Then legalism. We talked about ironclad contracts. In, you, in the Western culture, they want to see the contract. The contract must, the, all the I's must be dotted and all the T's must be crossed. But in, in Asian culture, the co uh, contracts are not regarded as a fixed legal um, instrument. Like you can even have a verbal, you know, converse. As long as they trust you, they're happy to move ahead with you. So you risk insulting your Asian uh, counterpart or the other party if you if you emphasize that. Oh, you know what? You must sign this contract, and if you don't sign this contract, you know, you get a penalty. Uh, then you you're likely not to, you know, close out that deal successfully or in a win-win situation with an Asian person or the Asian body. Now, even though for decisions, even though Asians are hier hierarchical in nature, they use the consensus style of decision making. Remember we talked about unanimity and then uh, majority rule and then consensus. They would rather, you know, go the consensus style because they do it to save relationships. They do it to save face. They don't want to disgrace anybody. They don't want to make anybody feel bad. So anything that's going to make them save face, save your, save their, their account, their people's face, they're ready to go with that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then I talked about India and I gave the example of the Indians. Don't put pressure on them because we put pressure on them, especially with regards to time. You're likely to just lose it. Um, so Asian cultures give priority to people's feelings, you know, culture, uh, cooperation, harmony. Unlike Western, the Western culture, they are more competitive, you know. And I even remember even at work, you know, where you have the experts, the Indians were very community, you know, they would sit together, eat together, they're doing stuff together. Unlike the Westerners, everybody just on their own, you know, they're just like, oh. Full evaluation, which is why time is not something you're going to be too heavy on them for. Unlike the Westerners who are comfortable with ambiguous situations. I give you an example. If I make an offer to an, a Western person, yes, they will go through the contract, they're happy, but they're happy to jump in, you know, close their nose, dive in and have an adventure. They just make quick decisions with limited information, right? Then the Asian people are high context, right? They, in terms of communication, they are indirect. They are suggest an Asian person will not come out and say something directly to you. They will, you know, go passively. They won't come out. Unlike the Western people who are direct, they will tell you whatever they need to tell you to their face, your face, and they're specific about it. So these are things that you need to take into consideration when doing international uh, negotiations. Then I also want to talk about South American, South American business people. Those are the Latino, you know, uh, the Argentine, you know, all those people in South America, Argentina and all that said so they tend to be more emotional emotionally intense than their asian and european counterparts they agree very warmly they're loud they're passionate those are the ones that when you get into a negotiation with them and you ask about their family uh you've entered their good books you already set the tone you've already you know set the tone for successful uh, closing out of deals unlike the westerner don't be with a westerner and start asking them about their family it will be like, what's your business? I mean, you can ask, you you can do small talk and talk about the weather. They're happy to talk about the weather. But if you're talking about the family, it's like, mind your business. So you need to understand those uh, nuances. Then they place a lot of value on respect. Then they rarely use the word no, you know. Re where if refusing a request to them 
is considered as impolite. So they, they 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 dance around it. They will not come out directly, unlike the Westerners who will just come out and say, you know what? No, this deal is not happening. I don't want this. It's not favorable to me. So you need to understand that. Now we talked about bringing in an expert in terms of negotiation, and that expert speaks to a coach. We talked we talked about you know getting someone to help you check your negotiation abilities. So that's the coach. And the coach is a great way to work around your weaknesses. That person will see your blind spots and then build on your strengths for success as a negotiator. The, the, uh, like I said, the coach will help you to see blind spots. There are certain things that you may not be aware of that that coach will help you see. So the coach could use different methods to assess your abilities. They could use role play, you know, have you paint out a scenario where you sit down, do negotiation with them, and they're able to tell you, okay, you did well here, you didn't do well here. And then they also will first ass assess, they will assess your, your performance through a 360 degree feedback session, right? And then they could even shadow you. So while you're in an actual negotiation, they are there to watch to see how your proceedings go. Now, the outcome of this is just to identify the patterns, you know, in your beliefs and behaviors and then give you a greater sense of self-awareness. So as a negotiator, it's good to continually reassess your capabilities to see that, you know, you may be overconfident and think that you're fantastic, but then, you know, you just need to have that person see you and say, mm, I think that you need to do better in this regard. Now, um, so the good a coach help a good coach helps you to test your assumptions, consider different perspectives, and reach a conclusion on how to proceed. Now, apart from doing direct negotiations, you may be required to be a mediator. As HR, these are things that we we find ourselves doing occasionally, right? And as an a mediator, you're expected to be impartial and not allow yourself get swept up in in emotion. That's why your EI is, is important to have a strong level of emotional intelligence. Now, what are the principles of effective mediation? You have to make sure that the disputing parties know that it's, it's a voluntary thing. So you have the two parties that you're supposed to mediate over. You remember that you're not the one that's supposed to make a decision for any of them. There's, you're there to just watch over the proceedings and make sure that things go okay, right? But you have to make, of course, they have, you have, they have to know that it's voluntary, that they have the right to exit if they choose to, and they have to be aware of their differences. Now, you have to allow the disputing parties take ownership of the conflict and its resolution. It's not your job to resolve them. It's not your job to, 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 to you know, um, step in and say anything. You're just there overseeing the proceedings. Remain neutral. Don't be biased. Don't try to influence the outcomes. Um, let the parties, disputing parties know that, you know, this mediation is confidential because when they know that it's confidential, then they are more at ease to release more information and then help them, guide them, steer them towards reaching a win-win situation. Now, mediation is a form of negotiation, which is why we're talking about, you might think, oh, why are we talking about mediation? It is a form of negotiation. And always remember that the aim of the mediation isn't to achieve absolute justice, but to find the most satisfactory option. And at the end of the day, it should be a win-win. You know, we emphasize on that. It should be a win-win for both parties. Now, as a mediator, you must allow them to express their feelings. You must take time to listen to them and understand the interests of the disputing parties. Do not allow the conflict to disrupt the day-to-day -day, um, activities of the organization. Now, sometimes to protect the organization's interests, the mediator, the manager as a mediator might need to exercise control on how conflict is mediated. Remember, mediated, remember we said earlier that you should remain, the mediator should remain neutral, should allow them to take ownership but then, you know, at a point where it's an organizational thing and you're trying to protect the interests, then you might need to step in to take control, but you need to know when to do that, right? And the stats said that 80% of business disputes are estimated to have been resolved through mediation. So mediation is so important. As HR, we, I think we some of us even do this mediation without maybe even, you know, knowing that we're doing mediation on a regular basis. But these are things, this is it's also a negotiation process. So you need to understand or have the skills of negotiation to be able to handle this um, thing. So understanding the process, of course, the process of mediation is, you know, initial contacts, you have everybody introduce each other, identify the issues and give information about the mediation process and the principles, then introduce yourself as a mediator, assess your own ability to mediate. Are you, are you not just because you're a HR manager or your HR, that does not automatically confer you the role of mediator check if you're actually ready to be a mediator and then check if, if the people are actually ready for mediation because some people may not be ready. They're just there, they want to fight. Determine if they are ready for that mediation and then have them commit to constructive, constructive mediation. 
then have a joint opening session where everybody is there, make sure that the environment is fit psychologically slave safe, where we talked about telling them that the information is confidential, then clarify the rules of engagement, and then educate the parties on their differences and work on the issues. Then after that, you can then have separate sessions, you know, where, you know, or even joint sessions where you facilitate, you know, you're not the one taking ownership, they're the ones deciding how they are going to solve the problems in their situations and then make proposals. Then at the end of it, you can now draft an agreement, you know, that is progressive, that, you know, that everybody's moving forward. Now, regardless of your field of expertise, a negotiator can benefit from learning from a master negotiator. Now, Uwa talked about Harvey Specter. If you don't know, if you've not watched Suits, maybe you want to go and watch it and see how Harvey Specter works. You know, he was he was a balance. He finally balanced, you know, the techniques of negotiation. So and who are the master negotiators? They have superior capabilities in three areas, ability to understand and analyze issues, ability to manage their emotions, especially in negative ones. So the master negotiators are very high in emotional intelligence. They have a high level of EQ. And then the ability to connect with others by building relationships, which is why a master negotiator does not go into a negotiation all about winning, but it's to build further long-term relationships. So they're very good at social interaction. Now, that is, those are the, those are the, if you want to be a master negotiator, those are the skills to build. Master negotiators do a lot of great due diligence, right? They don't just come to a negotiation table unprepared. They spend time thinking strategically. Think, when you think about negotiation, think about the game of chess. You know, you don't just make a move. You're thinking this move that I'm going to make, you know, if he puts his queen, I put my king. You know, they're thinking strategically. They're not just, they're not just diving in. They're thinking about how their move it's going to affect and impact the other person's move. How are we going to come to a win-win situation? Now, the master negotiator is able to see things from the other person's point of view. They're empathetic. They can put themselves in the other person's shoes, right? And it gives them a good position to off make a good offer or, you know, a trade-off. And then master negotiators are firm and they are clear on the issues they must have. And they're also flexible. So they know the balance of when to be firm and when to be flexible. They know they know where to apply that, those things to. I talked about them having a high level of EI, and then they approach every deal on an individual on an individualistic basis. I remember I said I said don't approach in every negotiation the same way. Same the way you treat negotiation A is not the same way you treat negotiation E B, and so they're able to adapt to the specific conditions of the negotiation that they're in, and their master negotiators more than anything invest and leverage on long term relationships they're not about just about making deals they diligently pursue their interests but they're also okay from walking away from a deal if their interests are not met so don't get me wrong they're there to have a win-win situation but if they feel that their interests are not being met they're happy to take the exit right this is all like an inexperienced negotiator who will not walk away because it's like ah i don't want to lose so whatever it is whatever is the outcome i will take it whether it's crumbs a master negotiator does not feel that anything is lost, does not feel that time is lost, does not feel like money is lost, does not feel like anything at all is lost, even if the deal doesn't go through. And with that, we come to the end of uh, the negotiation book. I hope that um, we have gleaned a thing or two uh, from the overall review. It was an interesting book. I told I'll tell you, oh, it was a bit of a struggle at first for me to read, but as the book went on further, it it got it began to you know um you know piece together. It was an enjoyable book, and it's you know there are things that we actually do that we are not even aware maybe that we do that that have, that we see in the book. But I hope that even some of the things that we haven't started doing, we can take them, apply them, and use them, apply them to our lives and to the workplace. And yeah, that brings me to the end of our review. I don't know, if, I mean, we're really pressed for time. I don't know if any, there are any comments, um, but I will hand over to Yemi. But before I hand over to Yemi, we just look, we look forward to our next book review that is going to come up shortly. That's also going to be a very interesting one. And I implore everyone to please participate. I look forward to having people, you know, other people come up and, you know, break these books down and let's look at things from different perspectives. So thank you, Yemi, over to you. Is Yemi there? Yemi, is he here? Can everyone hear me?
Yes, I can hear you. I, I'm, he's here, yes, but I don't I know. Hear you. Maybe so he's I... not. Maybe mm, he's busy like with her. something. Let me try and call him. Uh, uh, anyway, where were we waiting for him? Yes, Fantastic yes. presentation as usual. And okay. like, the summary was on point. Actually, we all were talking about balancing emotions and all that. And knowing um, your own strength and stuff. As usual, well done, well done. It was nicely summarized. And um, somebody like me that didn't finish reading the book. Anyways, you guys read it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so all we're waiting for, Yemi. Any other comments? Anything? Any any take-homes? I mean, I saw people's comments, a couple of comments here and there. But yeah, any, any take-homes? Any more things that you're taking home from this? Yeah, and the take home again for me was the um international negotiation where you have to understand mm -hmm. again it helps us as um HR people in our DI. Yeah. So we have to understand that yes. um each race, each people are different and we have to understand how to make them comfortable and feel at home. So we can get mm -hmm. best results out of our negotiations. Nice mm -hmm. job, nice job. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much. Thank you for your feedback. I don't know. I don't know what's happening with um, Yemi. Or I think maybe I would have to close myself this meeting. But uh, yeah, any more thing? I know we've pressed for time. We're about to enter into the weekend. But any other lessons from anyone? Any any take home? Anything that, you know, particularly struck out to you? you know, as a negotiator. Remember, it's it's something we do on an everyday basis. Everything, you know, like now I'm negotiating. Should I should I stop this meeting or should I wait for Yemi? You know, that's an internal negotiation. So, you know, we negotiate at every point of our lives. You know, am I, do I have to eat? Am I I'm hungry? Should I eat? Should I not? You know, the conversations you're having, you know, with yourself at work, at home, negotiations are going on the principles remain the same you're applying the same principles so any more take home if there are none i will have to bring this meeting to an end i think well, i think it's looking like home. i have to close <laughs> yes okay all right people thank you so much for staying on and like i said we look forward to the next uh book review which will come very very soon sooner than you think but yeah thank you so much and have a wonderful night thank you to everyone that contributed and Uwa, thank you so much for the amazing um the way you started it was amazing you started with a bang and it was really amazing thank you so much and everyone thank you for being a part of this and till next time i say Good night. <laughs>